Dana White's Contender Series 2024, week number 10. This is the Way in Recap Show, full card predictions and the betting breakdown. Looking forward to talking about each of the matchups on this card after seeing the fighters on the scales. So make sure you guys smash that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Turn the post notifications on and make sure you share the video too. The final Contender Series breakdown of 2024. I'm going to be sad to see the Contender Series go, but it's been a hell of a ride. The fight companion is tentative right now because I have a flight that lands around 7 p.m. Eastern time. With the Contender Series starting at 8, it depends. If I get out of the airport smooth and swift, I'll surely bring a fight companion. I'll attempt to definitely do a live stream, but stay up to date. I'll have the uh, members tab rocking and rolling or the community tab rather everybody will be able to see it not just members and i'll give you guys the updates of where i'm at uh, depending upon things perfect world yes fight companion tomorrow if not it is what it is we still went out with a bang the final contender series breakdown without further ado let's get into it first fight we have mohammed ado versus jonathan mckellif i am gonna go with mohammed ado to beat Jonathan McKellif. I think that Otto can be the saving grace for Canadian MMA at this point. If you've been watching the Contender Series consistently, you know the Canadians have absolutely sucked this season. Overall, Canadian MMA seems to be in the worst spot it's been in since, I don't know, since I've been watching back in like 2009. It seems to be in a horrible space. And I think that Otto could potentially be a guy that turns things around, okay? He's a flawed fighter, though. I mean, last time he's fighting, he's getting over on the throne. Multiple times, he's getting tossed to the ground. He's surviving nearly locked-in arm bars. His grit is what I think can lead him to the win here because he's definitely a flawed guy. Uh, he still has good offensive submissions, I would say he has relatively decent striking ability. He's got some power in his hands. He's kind of clean enough on the feet. He's got decent Muay Thai style kickboxing. It's not exceptional. It wasn't like a wow right off the bat. But I'm like, okay, this guy can mix it up. He can strike. He hits kind of hard. He's got good grappling. There's things to like. Yeah, he's a little flawed in wrestling and he makes mistakes. He's only 24. And then we got McKellif on the other side, who's a southpaw at an obvious speed disadvantage in striking. I noticed that right away. McKellif is more of a looping puncher. He'll try to work some straights and some jabs, but ultimately he really doesn't have great hand speed nor great precision with his punching. Two fights ago, he was actually chinned, and I think that he's you know susceptible to damage in this fight. The guy that chinned him is all right. He's one of those you know decent framed, brawling, up and coming slash like maybe not gonna make it types. The eight and three Adlon Bates. It was over in Australia at Hex. The Australians have been doing so good. On the Contender Series. That it just seems like for the final episode. Weird things are going to happen. And I think Canada finally gets a win. I think Otto could submit Jonathan McKellif. I feel like McKellif is going to look to wrestle. But he may gas. Put himself in a weird spot. And end up getting finished by Otto. So the pick is Mohamed Otto to find the finish. I'm going to say inside distance. We'll look at the scales. Let's check these savages out. Of course, things are out of order with uh, MMA Junkie. I don't know what you guys are up to. MMA Junkie, what, what you doing? I'm scrolling all the way to the bottom. Here we go. Jonathan McKelloff. He looks French, to be honest, man. He looks like French Canadian more than I do does. Uh, he looks like his name is Pierre. Kind of has the Cyrano de Bergerac schnoz. I don't know if you know what that is. If you studied English, you know what I'm talking about. Cool haircut, though. I mean, I like the flow. I respect the flow. As a fellow flow bro, I got respect for it. And this dude's in great shape. I just don't think he's that athletic and explosive. He's decent with his pressure style, though, and he's strong. But he's at a speed disadvantage. And now I got Mohamed Ado. You know, he looks okay. He's in decent shape. I mean, you know, he's got the visible abs. He's not as cut up as uh, McAuliffe, though. Then there's the face-off. You can see... Otto a bit smaller than him. McAuliffe definitely got the muscularity over him, but I just feel like, I don't know, something about McAuliffe is uh, too risky for me. 
I think both guys put themselves in bad positions. I think both guys might not be UFC ready. Just to keep it a buck with you, a buck 50, keeping it straight up. I don't think that either one of these guys is ready to make any type of run in the UFC. Both guys are young, 25 and 24. They need more experience. But that's not how it works because contender series, somebody, if they're impressive, has a good chance of getting signed. Mohamed Otto is the underdog. How? He opened that minus 200. My Australian subscribers, I know you guys are going to hate the fact that I'm picking against your boy, but I got to pick a Canadian to finally do things right and get a win. Mohamed Otto to save MMA in Canada. Because right now, it seems completely dead. I don't know. To save Canadian masculinity. To save Canadian MMA. This is more than just a fight. He is representing manhood of the entire country. And a loss here, I think all of the Canadian MMA gyms are closing down. Faraz Zahabi has got to relocate. I don't know, man. He might have to go to England or something like that. Plus 137 for Otto. McAuliffe minus 167. You are probably psychotic if you want to throw money at McAuliffe at minus 167. How the fuck is he a chalky favorite? If the line was even, that's fine. The fact that he opened up as a plus 160 underdog and now he's minus 167. Crazy money came in early. All the Australians bet him. I just don't think he's that good. Otto should find a way. But neither guy is really that good right now. Both flawed and developing prospects. Fight ends inside distance at minus 135. I'm going to say yes. Otto wins inside distance plus 235. I'm going to say yes. Otto by submission plus 350. I'm saying yes, but I'm not saying bet. Could he find the KO? Maybe. Not necessarily uh, out of the realm of possibility, but I don't know. You look at his wins. One KO win opposite four submissions. More likely he finds the sub. On the opposite side, you got McAuliffe with two KOs, two subs, two decisions. He's well-rounded. And he's got a KO loss, but it was in round four. Expect a weird fight. Expect uncomfortable scrambles. And expect Otto to find a way to take it home. Let's keep running up the card. We're going with Otto. Next fight, ladies going after it. We have Leslie Hernandez versus Julieta Martinez. We have Dora the Destroyer versus the Ninja Ferret. Do I even need to break this thing down? Dora the Destroyer is one of the most badass nicknames in the history of women's MMA. She's going to win the fight. I think it's a lock now, especially with the nickname battle. How the fuck am I going to pick a ninja ferret? What ferret do you know that knows Kung Fu? But Dora the Destroyer? That's absolutely badass. It honestly sounds like it could be like a really kinky porn name too, but I respect it on a fighter. Talk about the styles for a second. I mean, not just bullshit. Okay, so Julieta Martinez is actually a pretty nice kickboxer. She has experience doing some amateur kickboxing. She's a natural athlete that's really smooth in her striking. Overall, her rhythm is nice. I like her stand-up, and she's not bad on the ground either. She can definitely wrestle, work some good ground and pound. Uh, she was locked in an armbar recently, and she's resilient AF and refused to tap and ended up winning that fight. She's never lost as a pro. Now, the thing is, though, I think she is a atom weight. I don't think she's actually a straw weight. She's 5'1". She's really small for the weight class. And I think she would be way more comfortable at 105. She came in at 114 and a half. That's under the championship limit. She has fought as an atom weight and as an amateur. And she's also done some catchweight 110 fights. So I don't think she's a full-fledged straw weight. And now, you throw her... Dora the Destroyer, who is a clean boxer, okay? She's a legit Mexican, like, national-level boxer, and she's represented the country, all right? So she's won medals for them. She's got legit hands, and she also has developed a solid kickboxing game. Uh, she does have a black belt in Taekwondo, so it's not like she doesn't know what a kick is. And she doesn't seem to be bad on the ground either. She seems pretty damn strong, and she's got an obvious size advantage, which you guys will see in a second when I bring up the scales. She is also at MMA Lab, which is a fantastic gym. So badass nickname, size advantage high-level boxing in Mexico, and she's training at MMA Lab. Yeah, Dora the Destroyer for the win. I think she's going to get it done. Let's bring up the damn scales. Let's find these savage ladies. Where are the girls at? All right. 
So first, we have Dora the Destroyer, who looks absolutely fantastic. Dora the Explorer becoming Dora the Destroyer. I think that was the greatest thing to ever happen. Um, this is badass. She looks sick. She looks ready to go. She looks ready to kill. She looks ready to bite the ferret's head off with those teeth. Holy shit. And then we got the ferret who, you know what? The nickname is fitting. And like I said, she's a damn atom weight. Look, look at the side by side. She's relatively cut, but look at the size difference. Are you kidding me? Nah, I don't think that Julieta Martinez can deal with Dora the Destroyer. She's a good prospect, but this is just not her weight class. And I think she's going to be shown a different level by uh, the MMA lab prospect. So I'm riding with Dora the Destroyer to get it done. I see her winning this fight. You can see them side by side again. You see an obvious size difference. Just simply the bigger girl. And I think going to be the winner at the end of it is Dora the Destroyer. And the nickname is so badass you can't overlook it. Why? Why is Dora the Destroyer the underdog? She opened up as a plus 155 dog. Why? She's plus 105 right now. Yeah, she should win this fight. I don't get the odds. I'm taking a sip of water. It's 3.30 in the freaking morning. She's going to win. How does she win? Eh, I'm leaning decision, to be honest. Over 2.5 minus 215. Money line side of Dora the Destroyer is best. Dora the Destroyer by decision is plus 125. So give me Leslie Hernandez, a.k.a. Dora the Destroyer, to beat a pretty good prospect in Juliana Martinez, but, uh, you know, an undersized prospect that is simply in the wrong weight class. And uh, I'm going for the MMA lab team. And also, she's mad young. Julieta is literally 20 years old. Leslie's 26. Age difference is a factor to that maturity of the strength. I know Raul Rosas did it. Different scenario. Leslie Hernandez for the win. Let's keep running. Next fight. Featured fight. We have Yaidir Del Valle versus Antonio Montero. I think I just botched both their names. I think it's Antonio Montero. But uh, the names are not what it's about, okay? It's about the damn performances. And I'm going with Montero to get the win. I think the Brazilian Savage can beat Yadir. I don't know. The Cuban problem is uh, a pretty decent grappler. He's got good back control and he's got nice submission threats. He definitely is a fast starter and he looks to attack early on in fights, bring in good pressure. But overall, I would rate him as uh, more of a grappler than a striker. Uh, he does have a win against Michael Oswal, who did pretty good on Contender Series this season. Even though he lost, he gave a nice dog fight. And Del Valle, I just think is decent, but I'm not sold. I'm not sold. I'm not sold on a stand-up. And I don't think he has the wrestling advantage in this fight. Antonio Monterio, uh, you know, he's a pretty strong pressure grappler. He's got very good control from top position. Does have some finishes, but is definitely the type of fighter that's willing to take his time to find the finish and is willing to also grind out a hard-fought decision as opposed to rushing things and putting himself in a bad spot. Now, besides the grappling skill set, which I think is pretty impressive for Montaido, I feel as though his hands are pretty clean. I wouldn't say he's a great boxer, but he throws a lot of power into his strikes. He has kind of that Brazilian Muay Thai striking set. Does have really nice leg kicks and well-timed takedowns. I think Yadir Del Valle is going to be looking to wrestle in this fight. And I think he's going to struggle to get Antonio Montairo to the ground. And then I think he's getting ripped up with kicks. And then Montairo is also going to be threatening with grappling positions himself. I mean... He could put Del Valle in a bad spot on the ground and potentially get the finish. He's got a handful of submission wins. You can see five subs there. But he's very comfortable going to decision. I know we're on contender series where we're definitely looking for finishes, but I'm not going to like blindly say, yeah, he's going to find the finish when I'm feeling in my heart of hearts that he probably wins a hard three rounds against Del Valle. So Antonio Montaigne for the win. But I'm not necessarily sold on him getting a contract for sure because it might not be the most entertaining shit you've ever seen. You can see Del Valle there. He looks pretty ripped up. Looks pretty intense. Dude's got the bulging biceps. 
And, uh, you know, he looks ready to go. I don't know. He's kind of he's kind of got a funny look to him. And then this is just not the face of a loser, though. He looks kind of like a Carlos Prates, Anderson Silva, uh, you know, Joe Anderson, Brito, inbred baby. Like you mix the three of their DNAs. And, uh, you know, I think this is kind of what you get. And I feel like that's a good combination of the big three. The style is different, but bro, this Brazilian kid, he's good, man. Montaito is clean with it. I don't know. I don't see him losing. I think he's pretty strong on the ground, and he was listed at being two inches shorter, but I think he's got the edge over the uh, bobblehead on this one. Holy shit. That neck is there for the taking, too. Montaito is going to win the fight. It makes perfect sense to me that... Uh, He's able to stop Del Valle's onslaught of grappling, touch him up with big shots on the feet, and then win grappling positions. He could catch the neck, bro. Look at the long neck on Del Valle. I think Montaido's going to get the W in this one. He seems pretty clean with it, and I feel as though, uh, you know, the Brazilian savages tend to fare decent. And I also think he trains with Bruno Ferreira, who's pretty dangerous and uh, fun UFC middleweight. I think he can win this fight. We're going with Montaido to pull through. I think he's taking it home. As far as the odds for the fight, Del Valle's a slight underdog at plus 100. Montaido sitting at minus 130. He opened up as a dog, but the lines flip. Crazy odds this week. Every fight this week is money lineable, regardless of the side that you're on. Now, as far as the prop betting side, let's see. We got an over one and a half. No, over two and a half. Minus 175 for the over two and a half. I'm feeling it. Montaido plus 255 to win inside distance. Decision plus 185. I really don't love the prop bets here. And you're betting on these up and coming guys, which is dangerous enough. We got near even odds. If you can get it at close money, it's not a horrible, horrible play. Because I truly believe Montaido can win in the striking and in the grappling here. Del Valle's best position is probably with back control, maybe even a body triangle. But I just don't think it's that likely that he does it. So Junior Negao, Antonio Montaido to take it home. And uh, I think he's winning a hard fought three rounds, but it's going to be a clean W. And I think Dana will be in a good mood and he'll be giving out contracts left and right, to be fair. Co-main event, we have Nick Piccinini versus Luis Garule. Piccinini recently fought and uh, he was actually scheduled for the damn rematch against Jack Duffy, but Duffy pulled out. I'm going to pick Piccinini. Garule's got a lot of hype. Uh, he trains with Factory X Muay Thai, which is a really good gym. And I think that he's pretty solid overall. He brings a pressure striking style, very Thai boxing base, good low kicks, heavy punches, consistently in your face, ready for a hard three rounds. Does have good grappling defense too. And I do feel as though he's a submission threat. The thing is, Nick Piccinini has a clear-cut wrestling advantage. I feel as though Jack Duffy just had a really tricky frame for Piccinini. But this matchup here is actually kind of way better for Piccinini. I think that his wrestling is going to be a useful tool in this fight. And I'll anticipate that at some point Piccinini is able to get Garule to the ground, garner some control time, and then wear him down with a bit of peppering ground and pound. I still think Piccinini's a blue chip prospect. He's decent with his hands as well as his grappling game. And I don't think Garule has the one-shot knockout power. Now, some about Garule, I will say, the dude has the mountaintop traps. Holy shit. He's built like an absolute freak. At 125 pounds, he's a specimen. We'll pull up the damn scales. But I'm expecting Piccinini to do okay in the striking department. And then I'm thinking that he'll probably thrive if they tie up. You can see the face off here. Piccinini on the scale looks shredded and good to go. Whoa. Whoa. Am I tripping? Garule looks completely different. Garule has lost a lot of muscle, bro. Look at Garule in this picture. Testosterone has got to be like at 1,000. And then it's looking like it's at 350. I'm so confused. Even Garule's last fight, he looks stacked with muscle. That's crazy. Nick Piccinini is probably going to dominate him 
in a more clear fashion than I initially was anticipating because the absolute melting of the physique for Garule is rather suspect of uh, PED abuse. Now, I'm not saying he's definitely guilty, but if I see a guy stacked with muscle not too long ago and then his biggest fight of his life, he looks like he deflated. It's suspicious. And he took this fight on short notice, right? He's stepping in to replace Jack Duffy. And Garule actually just fought three weeks ago. It was a win at uh, Cage Fury. Or uh, rather, Fury. He beat Jacob Silva. You guys remember Jacob Silva? He had a good fight on the Contender Series, I believe, with Jeff Molina. Uh, since then, he's been hot and cold, man. He's very 50-50. He's a 50-50 journeyman. He had the back of Garule a little bit. And I think Piccanini can absolutely body him. I see this as a 30-27 you know what, though? The fact that Garule's physique melted, I think I'm going to go pick an Edie inside distance now. If Garule was the Jack Savage that I'm used to seeing, then I'm like, all right, he can survive late and it's a 29-28. But I'm thinking Piccanini might fuck him up on the ground. It's interesting. The odds for Piccanini at minus 130, so close money. Garule at plus 100. Obviously, I'm looking at the Instagram of Garule and everybody from Factory X is like, yo, number one flyweight outside of the UFC, yada dee, yada do. I'm not sold, bro. Plus 375 for Piccanini. I'm picking Piccanini. I think he's going to win this fight. I think he's live for a sub, plus 500. Let's see. Piccanini's recent methods of victory. Split decision, rear naked choke, submission, submission. He's fighting another undefeated guy, but somebody's O's got to go. And I'm going to say Nick Piccanini submits Luis Garule. Look at this fucking picture. It's blowing my mind. Look at the traps and the delts in this picture. And look at the fucking jawline. Look at the head shape and size. And then look at him here. Who the fuck is that guy? I don't recognize him. I don't think that's him. Besides the tattoos, man. Like, it doesn't look like the same guy. That's freaky. Uh, yeah, so Nick Piccanini. I'm calling a damn finish now. I've decided to go against my initial decision call. And uh, I think Garule is taking an L. Nick Piccanini for the W. Welcome to the UFC, bro. He's definitely getting a contract. Next fight on the card, it's our main event. If you guys haven't yet, smash that damn like button. If you're new, subscribe. And uh, the main event, Nick Klein versus Geraldo Souza. I'm going to be picking Geraldo Souza. He kind of reminds me of uh, Paulo Costa a little bit. Not necessarily the exact same style, but I see similarities in the power Muay Thai. Souza's actually got a kind of some clean KO power. And he's seemingly found his knockout ability more recently. If you look, knockout, knockout, and then there's a submission there. But the past two, he's been finding heavy punches to his opponent's face, okay? And even though this guy that he fought would look like he was probably 60, uh, still a clean KO win over a strong Brazilian dude. Ronaldo Souza, or Geraldo Souza, excuse me, it's 3 a.m., give me an excuse. Geraldo Souza has a clear-cut striking advantage. He's way more powerful and clean with it than Nick Klein. On top of that, he also is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. So big striking edge with competent grappling. On the opposite side, Nick Klein is a wrestling pressure fighter. Now what's crazy is this dude literally debuted in MMA as a pro at heavyweight. He's fought from welterweight all the way to heavyweight. This dude has fought all over the damn place. So I do respect Nick Klein. He's a strong wrestler. He's actually got a nice win over Colin Huckbody, who a long time ago was a contender series winner, but he ended up never debuting in the damn UFC. So that's kind of sad. Nick Klein's wrestling and pressure is good, but his stand-up looks kind of stiff. Now he's very tall and long, but he doesn't really have a great jab. And he also kind of has suspect cardio. He looked exhausted after the Colin Huck buddy win. Uh, he got finished late in this fight here with Doran Dokaj. And I think dealing with a pressure heavy Brazilian like Geraldo Souza, who's good at overwhelming people and weathering storms, is just going to be too much for him. I'm going Geraldo Souza to find the KO. He does have this fight as a draw. 
a year and eight months ago. It's been a while. He's on a nice three-fight win streak. He's got all finishes over the last three. He's got more MMA experience than Nick Klein, and he's definitely more powerful in the striking with a clear-cut knockout advantage and a way more likely chance of getting a finish, whereas Nick Klein would probably need to embrace the grind over three rounds. All right, let's keep looking. All right, where are these savages at? We got to find the damn scale. Bum, 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 bum. There he is. Geraldo Souza. I'm be honest, he ain't looking like Paulo Costa at 185, man. I don't know. He gave those vibes on the regional scene. Maybe not now. But his striking power is legit. Nick Klein looks kind of like a cracked out American McGregor. You see what I'm saying? Like, is that Conor McGregor? If you squint, you're like, no, no, it's a redneck. That's funny as fuck, bro. Nick Klein is the all-American McGregor. Similar chess piece, but instead of it being a fucking gorilla, it's a bird. That's about as American as you can get. America up in here, man. I think he was also going by, like, the Amish gangster or something like that. The Amish dominator. Let me know what his other nickname was. Something about being Amish. And then there's the face-off. Both guys are in good shape. Intense face-off. I think Nick Klein is getting chinned. He does not have striking skill to deal with Souza. And I don't think he's just going to wrestle fuck this Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. I don't see it happening. I think we're going to see Geraldo Souza drop some heavy hammers on uh, Klein's face and probably knock him out in the first or second round and finish off the contender series. Okay, 2024 with a damn emphatic KO and a savage contract win. Minus 155 for Geraldo Souza, plus 125 for Nick Klein. I got news that Gianni the Greek was playing the value of the line. I'm going for the value side of Nick Klein. Gianni called me, bro. That's the message from him. That's him spiritually going through me. I guess I just got possessed by the Greek. So if the Greek is going plus 125, we're going minus 155, and we're going with the confident Brazilian pick. We're going against Gianni, and we're going to win. Uh, yeah, per usual. We got this shit. Geraldo Souza by KO. I think he's pulling a violent win out. Looking at it, it's plus 325 for the damn knockout, and I think it's very live to end under two and a half rounds, but under one and a half is plus 145. Ends inside distance, minus 215. I do think we're ending inside distance. I do think Souza's getting a finish. If you don't want the KO, you just go Souza inside distance. That line is plus 100, and I like the chance of it, man. We're going for Geraldo Souza, the Brazilian savage, to take a violent win home and put Nick Klein to bed. Those are the final Contender Series predictions of 2024. And I feel sad. I feel like I might cry, to be honest with you guys. This is an emotional day for me. And it's 3.46 in the damn morning. And I'm sad about it. But it's all right. It's all right. Because we got UFC every week. <sighs> sad day. It's all right. Let's keep running. It's a beautiful day. Let's jump to the parlays. We're not done yet. I want to talk parlays. If you parlay this card all the way through like a sick fuck, maybe that's the way to cash. Because this is a damn weird one, man. Let me actually bring up best fight odds on the screen so we can look at the odds in front of us and actually see what the damn tags are going to be. So, if you like Piccanini to win, he's a slight favorite. Piccanini with the weirdo auto for the W plus 368 with Souza plus 669. This parlay seems fucking risky as hell. I'd rather do UFC parlays. Listen, if you tune into this week's best MMA bets, you know I'd be crushing the UFC parlays. All right? The UFC parlays are where you cash big. Contender series is D-Gen shit, especially this week. Julieta Martinez. I'm thinking, fuck auto. I don't even want him. Or throw him in. 1,300. Holy shit. This is just a dangerous betting card because these chalk because these lines are not chalky. These lines are too valuable. It's freaking me out. Julieta Martinez, Geraldo Souza, Nick Piccanini, plus 487. If I had to go for it. Otto Adamin as a dog. Montairo, whose name I may have botched. Now you got plus two thousand if you're looking to sweep the card. I think I'm gonna sweep this card though. I think we're getting a clean sweep. So maybe the plus 2,000 is the money zone. But it's contender series. So I have to tell you to bet intelligently, not to be a degenerate psychopath. 
be smart, take it easy. This is wild card shit because none of these guys have proven anything at a high level of fighting. But I do like the chances of certain things to happen. Damn, we don't have any good lines there. Like Otto to win by submission, which is, you know, a D-Gen call, but or Otto inside distance with the side of Leslie Hernandez. Did I put Julieta Martinez? I meant to put Leslie Hernandez. Let's see. Piccanini, Leslie Hernandez, Geraldo Souza plus 560, Mohamed Otto plus 1516, and now Montaito plus almost 3,000. Holy shit. So if you threw in Otto inside distance, Leslie straight down the center, Piccanini straight down the center, Geraldo inside distance, and then you threw in Montaro, you psycho. But the fucking lines are going to go crazy with that. Please, bet contender series intelligently, man. It's so dangerous. Like, I think Piccanini wins because Garule didn't look great. I think Geraldo should chin climb. Um, I think Leslie Hernandez is a good dog versus Julieta. I see her winning the fight. Otto's going to win a weird one with McAuliffe. And then Montairo and Devale, or Del Valle, excuse me. Montairo's just got to defend these takedowns and then bring some grappling pressure of his own. I think he can thrive and win. But yeah, going to be a wild card of a night. I hope you guys enjoyed the final contender series breakdown. Maybe we just got to do the D-Gen clean sweep parlay to throw it all out there to close out contender series. Smash the likes. If you're new, subscribe. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. W's in the comments if you got nothing to say. Your boy's tired, man. I want to get to sleep. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you all tomorrow, hopefully for the Fight Companion, if not for a live stream. Love you guys. Peace out. See you later. Enjoy. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.